I'm really excited about this book. I really am because I've been a fan of you and Christopher since you since I met you and you came on to the Curse of Oak Island. I've been a fan of your work, uh, mm. the extensive research that you guys have done. When I first heard you guys talking about this book coming out, I thought, oh my gosh, this is one that's not only do I have to have, but anybody mm. that has any interest in any of this, whether you're talking about the, the Templars or um, Jerusalem and the and the menorah and the Ark of the Covenant, and it's possible, you know, movements across Europe into North America. Anybody that's interested in any of that needs to get this book. It's the Jerusalem Files, The Secret Journey of the Menorah to Oak Island. Yes. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it, is, it is very closely tied to the show. Uh, Rick Largina wrote uh, the foreword uh, to the book. Uh, oh, so he really? was in there. Yeah, he did. Yeah, oh, and wow. uh, he was. Um, he got one of the first copies. Um, and also, there's there's a process here, right? So uh, the History Channel and Prometheus uh, cleared us, you know, to to release all this information uh, because yeah. much of it, you know, you know how they always say that war rooms uh, take hours and they only, uh, you know, edit it down to to two minutes uh, for an episode, yeah. um, you know. This is the war room that you always wanted to uh, to attend. Uh, that's great. How many pages is this book? That it's three hundred and six. Oh yeah. Okay, that's not too it's, bad. I, I, yeah, it's not too bad, but it has it has like uh, this is like pages of timeline. Oh wow! See, that's important stuff. And we've been we've been careful to include every reference that we that we could find. Uh, so, so, one, so, so first of all, uh, um, you just blew me away with your uh, with your kind words. Thank, thank you so much. It means an I awful mean, lot uh, to me, and, I, and I'm sure uh, uh, also to Chris. Um, it's, you know, it's it's been an epic undertaking. It's it's a lot of work writing a book that we, you know, underestimated uh, ever so slightly. And uh, I guess if we <laughs> if we would have known how much work it'd be, you know, we probably uh, wouldn't have started in the first place. Um, but but one, we just went uh, where the research uh, took us, and and one thing that that annoyed us from uh, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, I, I have a library here full of uh, of books, many uh, about Oak Island, um, but you know, many authors in the genre are are uh, uh, aren't very good at uh, you know recording their sources and. Uh, uh, so we so we wanted this to be something somewhere between, you know, a a, a police case file, um, and a, a you know historical timeline, and you know a great treasure story, and then also you know document uh, the journey that Chris and I made uh, researching this thing, yeah. and uh, and I, and I think we managed from from the people that have read this, uh, you know, we've heard that um, you know it's a it's an ambitious story, it's it's a big story that spans you know. A few thousand years and three continents, um, but I, I still, I, 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 I hope you know. I, I can't judge. Uh, it's very hard to to read it uh, objectively now, but yeah. but I think we managed to master the complexity of the uh, of the overall mystery, um, which is something that that I really want. I mean, I mean, the, the the whole reason that that we started this book was that I, you know I it was on my fiftieth birthday. Um, then my girlfriend said, you know, you, you need to start writing this stuff down because it's, it's killing you. It's all, you know, it's in your head. Yeah. And uh, I didn't really want to do this on my own. So, you know, ask Chris, uh, because, you know, we were researching day and night together. Yep. Uh, and I said, uh, what do you think? Shall we do this together? Because, um, you know, I'm, I, you know I, do, I do loads of research, but there's something, there's something with Chris Morford that, you know, he sees stuff that I don't. Um, he has this esoteric occult mind that he that he applies to to stuff uh which which is you know breathtaking to witness uh, sometimes uh and i guess i'm a bit better in you know putting things in the timeline and then drawing the conclusions and you know find finding the way through the narrative and then you know uh, but but then together uh, you know we, we thought we'd be an unbeatable team 
So, Christopher, um, you know, we have spoken. Uh, we were talking with uh, Corian here just a little bit and kind of getting his side of all this work that you guys have done to put this book together. Um, how did you guys, you you know, you worked together on Oak Island, of course. You you came together at Oak Island, and now you right. work together to produce this book. I mean, how has that been for you? Um, I never would have believed it, you know, years ago. Uh, that we'd be here here at this point. Um, it all seems like a, a bit of a dream, you know. Um, yeah, this this book would not exist you know, without Corian. Um, there's uh, there's no way I could have written this on my own. I, you know, in addition to coming together and 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 uh, you know, kind of enhancing each other's talents, I guess, if you want to say it like that. Uh, we also put constraints on each other, <clears throat> necessary constraints, right? He he keeps me grounded um, if I kind of go off on a bit of a wild tangent or something, right? He's <laughs> he's a, a perfect foil for that, and he'll he'll let me know right away. You know, that's yeah, it might be a reaching bit a bit on that, you know, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, most. Yeah. Most of the time he's right, but yeah. <laughs> Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> no, he's so he's very level-headed in that, and he, you know, he looks at it from a reader's point of view too. Right. In my mind, it's it's making sense. Uh, I'm drawing from my experiences, my affiliations, and uh, but I may not be explaining it so well, you know, and I may not be able to back it up because um maybe there are no documents for these particular things it's kind of a spoken mouth to ear thing going on right so, right right um uh so he yeah that, that's one of the ways we work together very well and uh i think i i can kind of take him sometimes and say well why don't you, you know maybe look at it from this direction and let's unlock that symbology there you know, I think there's a deeper story to that part. Yeah, I, I'll be looking for a document for days, trying to, you know, I know this reference is out there somewhere. I just need to find it. I can't go digging through the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale in France. And um, Corian, I need this, you know, and then two seconds later, he's, he's downloaded it. It's uh, probably laminated it. He's shipped it overnight. It's, uh, you know, it's... <laughs> One of the things that surprised me is that it's become much more of a of an American book than I than I was prepared for. Awesome. Um, yeah, because, because you know we we sort of knew that that the early roots of the mystery were probably lying in the Middle East, uh, so it does start right. um, uh, somewhere over there. But 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 then you know in in the last couple of centuries that you know the the theater of operations uh, really moved to North America. Uh, you know, around the French, Re French Revolution, and and there's some really really cool connections to do, you know, with the menorah, uh, with Oak Island, but but I, I guess with with a larger um, birth of North America, of cur of you know present day North America, that that sort of unraveled uh, itself in front of us, um, which was cool, and you know at every junction you need to think you know is this my bias speaking or is uh you know are we jumping to conclusions here or from my very first war room on oak island <clears throat> i had brought in uh, the possibility of fdr's involvement in yes. this wider scheme everyone we're all familiar with the fact that he was a treasure hunter on oak island uh -huh. um and that his grandfather was uh, part of the Truro. He was an investor in that corporation. <clears throat> and so you may have seen from our other presentations uh, when we discussed Nicholas Poussin and his painting, The Shepherds of Arcadia, and its relationship to the treasure here. We went over the sort of pentagonal geometry that exists within that painting. Mm -hmm. That same shape, the pentagon, uh, 
it pops up again and again along this trail. Uh, we, we see it in Templar churches, for example. Um, it appears on several key Gothic cathedrals throughout France, very special cathedrals that provided us with uh, some amazing, often uh, hair-raising clues along the way. So that pentagon, that star, was, was in a way guiding us along. Uh, and, well, it wasn't too much of a leap to uh, go from FDR and this pentagonal shape uh, to the largest pentagon in the world, uh, which happens to be in DC wow. and is the headquarters of the US military, it's the Pentagon, right? Right. So, <clears throat> which was built by FDR, um, not personally, but it was under his administration. Wow. It was built against uh, all the advice of his military commanders, wow. um, his personal advisors. They said, number one, you can't build it there. It's a swamp. <clears throat> You're going to put one of the largest buildings on earth in a swamp. And uh, he says, no, it has to be. It has to be there. They had other sites picked out. And so they had to sink over 41,000 pylons wow. just to get this thing supported in the swampy area. The second problem was the shape of the thing. As his military commander said, you've just built the largest bullseye on the face of the planet. Mm. You know? And uh, they had advised against that as well. Why don't you build it this way? Why don't you break it up a bit? Put one building here, one building there. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. He was completely against it. It had to be a pentagon shape. It had to be in that exact spot. Wow. <clears throat> and the deeper we looked into it, uh, we understood why. And I, I can't go too much farther into it but um no, we want people to get the book and find out why <laughs> <laughs> i think his, his family has been uh, involved in this for quite some time uh, wow. we noticed that uh the, the coat of arms of the roosevelt family uh, used to look a certain way that he actually altered them really which is highly unusual um they always featured three roses because the, the name Roosevelt is like a rose field or rose rose garden. Oh, okay. And um, I do have a drawing. Uh, I printed this out for you. But th this is what it was changed to. Oh, okay. Now these rose stems, uh, the rose stems were separate before, and he crossed them. So what do you call? A crossed rose, but a, a rosy cross, right? Or a Rosicrucian in a way. Wow. The center now, now forms a pentagon with the branches that he added. Um, the Latin down here uh, translates to uh, he who planted it cares for it. So what they planted. Yeah. Wow. We'll go into that in the book. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> wow, that's I tell you what, talk about a tease. Oh my goodness, that's uh, that's 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 incredible. There's quite a bit more here, but um, yeah, the fact that there are three points here in a triangle shape the red feather, uh, the plume on top of the crest mm -hmm. uh, these are all giveaways, and these are not things we were looking for specifically. Uh, that's what's kind of amazing in my eyes about this book. We didn't have an agenda. We 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 dig, and these things are, are uncovered, you know. And in a way, they kept leading us on. We weren't looking for a menorah, uh, but we discovered a cipher, if you will. You know, this book is full of um, of revelations. Um, we, we try 
um, to make uh, people look at things, you know, with different eyes. Um, and to give you one example, um, if you're ever in Paris, um, there's a, a street there, it's called the Rue Faubourg Saint-Honoré. It's one of the most fashionable streets in Paris. Uh, you'll have the, you know, Cartier, um, uh, Hermes, uh, you know, all the big fashion stores, all the big brands are there. It's like uh, Rodeo Drive uh, in, in Paris. Right. Um, in the middle of that street is the Church of St. Roche, um, which is not a very well-known church, but it's bigger than Notre Dame. Uh, and it was um, heavily visited by the French royal family. Um, now, normally, when you enter a church, all the statues will face you, um, but not in St. Roche. St. Roche is the burial place of André Le Notre. Um, so this huge um, menorah, seven-armed menorah, uh, in the gardens of the Palace of Versailles in France, was created by the Sun King Louis XIV and his gardener, André Le Notre. André Le Notre, you know, he, he basically invented what we know today as the French garden. And his designs were used, you know, in, in Greenwich in London, uh, in Italy, but of course, primarily in France. And the pinnacle uh, of, his, uh, of his work uh, was the gardens of Versailles. André Le Notre spent his life, you know, changing lakes into forests and forests into lakes with thousands of people and he was the master of the line of sight so by projecting the right lines of sight through a garden he could elongate or you know widen a view um correct uh, certain flaws in the landscape and that's exactly how he created this menorah um, uh, in the gardens of his uh, master louis the 14th andre le notre is buried in the church of saint roche and his bust oh, okay. you know his his um, uh, uh, marble bust faces away from the viewer so you enter the church and you find the chapel where he uh, where he's buried and uh we noticed that le notre's wife instructed the sculptor to create a bust of her husband facing away at a certain angle really? now if you're in the church and you see his bust he's facing away from him he's looking staring his 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 gaze is fixed at a space in the very back of the church really and if you walk there following his gaze you end up in this round chapel that has a huge templar cross overhead oh, wow. and in front of you will be a life-size copy of the jewish menorah with its seven arms Andre Le Notre, who created the Gardens of Versailles, Andre Le Notre, who projected a giant seven-arm menorah, four mile, you know, three mile tall, uh, 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 near Paris in France, was immortalized to forever stare at a copy of the menorah in the back of the Church of Saint Roch. Wow. Um, it's our book. Our book is full of this, uh, uh, these sort of things, you know. Uh, seemingly, you know, coincidental, uh, but when you look down into it, um, you know, we know his wife uh, requested the sculptor to adjust uh, uh, the bust. Um, uh, we know the date that the menorah is put there that coincides with other dates. Um, um, oh boy, this, this, I mean, we, we call this, you know, a real life Da Vinci code. That, that's, I mean, that is exactly what it was. The point here, too, is that you need to go there. That's also why we do these European yeah, tricks, the trips on, on the on the Curse Rock Island. Yeah. You yes. need to feel it. You need to see it. I mean, this is the way that talking to the caretaker of the Church of St. Roche, we found out that, that which is not publicly known, that there's, there's a, actually a secret tunnel running from that church to the Palais Royal, so to the royal palace where, you know, really? uh, where the king used to live. And Louis the Fifteenth, Louis the Sixteenth, they came all the way for, to Versailles to check in at the royal palace, and they they would use the secret tunnel to go to Saint Roch, wow. where they would have two secret lodges uh, in the wall of the church over the altar to the left and the right of the altar that you could access um, using a stairs in the wall. And we've been there. We've been there. We've been in there. We've wow. been in this in this place where the tunnel comes in, and where you still have the the silver crucifix of um, uh, Mary Antoinette um, uh, hanging on the wall because she didn't have time to pick it up uh, on her way to uh, to the guillotine. 
um uh, and and all this all this stuff is just like and we were sitting on all this stuff right so i'm we're so glad that it's finally um in book form and you know within a month from now you know everybody will be able to, to read this and i you know we couldn't be more pleased i mean we're we are i mean i guess if you ask chris uh, uh tonight you know we we still can't believe that <laughs> that, that, that this is going to be a book it's uh it's i mean you know we've been on television which is some sort of a, an experience but having, oh, yeah. you know, get, getting a book into a bookshop is um is, is just beyond belief right. All right. Now, the book is going to be released on February 13th. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you guys, you mentioned earlier that you have several places that you're going to be available because you uh, live uh, in the Netherlands, correct? So yes. now you have to you have to come over to the United States to make some of these appearances. And I guess you're going to be doing some actually starting off on the 13th, the day of the release of the book. Is that right? Uh, the day before even. Uh, oh, really? So okay, right yeah, so Chris and I really wanted to do uh, a book tour together. So we start in the US, and I think later we'll uh, we'll come to the UK and to Europe. Um, so we, we're going to start uh, uh, around where Chris lives. Um, Hilton Head area, yeah. Yeah, Hilton Head area. So I think the first place is Buxton Books in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. Uh, we'll be, where we'll be for a, a pre-release party on the 12th. Um, so Buxton Books is, you know, this iconic independent bookstore. Uh, it's very well known, uh, and uh, the owner happens to be a huge fan of the Curse of Oak Island. Uh, so we couldn't ask for a better host. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly. where we'll start. We'll do, you know, do a, a short presentation, um, uh, answer any questions, uh, do some book signings, and you know, make sure, uh, um, um, you know, everybody gets uh, the attention that they that they deserve, and it's enormously exciting for us. You know, of course, to to to, uh, to finally get the book out. Um, so after um, Charleston, we uh, we moved the show to Hilton Head on the thirteenth, and okay. I think the next confirmed date. Um, I would need to check the. Let me check here. Um, oh, here we are. So it's on our website, thejerusalemfiles.com. Okay. Thejerusalemfiles.com. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, on February 16, we'll be in uh, Vienna, uh, Virginia. So that's okay. close to Washington, D.C., where we'll be in the Bart's Alley Bookshop uh, to do a little event. Um, and um, the next confirmed date is. Uh, February 18, uh, which is in Walpole, uh, Massachusetts, so close to Providence, right. um, where we'll uh, visit the Barnes & Noble store of the uh, fabulous Kathleen Caldwell. Um, so that's the four confirmed dates. Uh, we have more stuff coming up, so uh, uh, we will f uh, publish through uh, Facebook and Instagram. And, and uh, But the best source, I guess, is the, uh, the website, uh, on the website, people can uh, subscribe, um, and we, you know, we, we regularly send out, uh, you know, newsletters or news flashes uh, whenever we have new dates, uh, because of course, you know, we want to see as many people as we can uh, and shake all these hands and sign all these copies. Uh, should be awesome. Books. All right. uh, any chance there will be an audiobook version of it coming out in the future at any point? Do you think um, the audiobook uh, will be available also on the thirteenth? Uh, so you already have one. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so um, oh, that's be great. it will be exclusive on Audible, uh, at least I think for the short term. Um, and it's uh, it's almost ready. It's been read by Simon Schatzberger, uh, who's a uh, an English actor who has the, I tell you, writing a book. I mean, getting an email from your publisher and, uh, you know, with, uh, can you have a look at these uh, six voices and uh, decide who's going to read your book? Now, that was cool. Uh, so, si so Simon uh, uh, is reading it, uh, and I think the audiobook is available for pre-order as of January 30. Uh, we'll publish that through the website, mm. and uh, and and here, so here's the result. It's uh, yeah. 306 pages of delightful uh, um, Oak Island research, and it's it's the book that that we were looking for and didn't exist. Right. Let's uh, let's try to get something planned uh, when yeah. we know your schedule. Uh, let's work together, work something out. And uh, yeah. again, I, I can't wait to uh, meet you in person. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, same, same here. So, I mean, uh, Chris and I have discussed this. Um, so, you know, I think we're uh, of the same opinion. We would love, love, love to do this. So, um, whenever the schedule's uh, ready, uh, we'll get in touch and uh, we'll uh, we'll plan something. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, take care, Jeff. Have a great night. And Thank give you. my regards to uh, to brother Chris. Okay, will do. All right. <laughs> take care, my friend. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.